Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to talk about cheating chillers. Now this is something that comes up on the forums fairly regularly, where people have made uh, water chillers that are theoretically impossible to be able to achieve the temperatures that they achieve. And we're going to talk about how that happens, so we're going to do that right now. So, we have a TEC. Now TEC is in here. Okay. Now we ap we apply some power to it. Yes, through here. Uh, and that will move some heat from the cold side to the hot side. Now for the for this video we're not really, really interested in how much power it's using, we're just talking about how much power it moves or how many watts it moves. So we have the hot side over here. And that goes through the radiator and it goes through a pump and res which we can't see in this picture. And that's pretty self-explanatory. Now on the cold side, we have pretty much the same thing. We have the cold side over here, and that would go through a res. That would then cool your CPU, and then it would come back again. Now if we apply, let's assume that this CPU is going to be using a hundred watts of electricity and therefore we need to kill, uh, cool 100 watts. Okay, so it's rejecting 100 watts. So it's adding 100 watts to the cold side of the loop and therefore to cool this we need to move at least the 100 watts to the hot side. So let's assume that the TEC is removing 100 watts. Okay, now that is perfectly fine. We're adding 100 watts over here and we're removing 100 watts from here. Right, everyone's probably per perfectly happy with that. Now, what the issue is, is that some people come in and say, I'm going to exaggerate it here, that they have a CPU that is rejecting 100 watts or using 100 watts of electricity and yet they're managing to cool this with a 10 watt TEC. And they will uh, provide screenshots and load tests showing you that they are able to get fantastic temperatures while only having very low wattage TECs. And this seems impossible, but they've done it, so you can't argue with them to some degree. Well, what happens is this, it really is manipulating water to achieve this. So what happens is you obviously have water in a water chiller. And we have a reservoir, and let's say it's half full. We then turn on our TEC cooling loop and our CPU at say idle, and let's assume that it's only going to be using one watt at idle, the, the loop can then run slowly removing all of the, the heat or the power, if you like, out of the cold side of the loop. So this then ends up being 10 degrees C, or maybe we should use 13 because of that. They then fire up their load te tester and their CPU outputs 100 watts and yet this temperature of the water does not increase very quickly. And so that's how they're able to get really good temperatures while theoretically being impossible, as in you're applying 100 watts of, of heat to it and you're removing 10 and yet the, the cold side of the loop is still well below ambient. And that is because water is quite amazing. It has a very high specific heat value, which is essentially its ability to store energy. So we've obviously made cups of tea and coffee, 
and it actually takes an incredible amount of energy to heat water. You have a few litres of water, you fire up your kettle, it'll put out probably a kilowatt, possibly more, and it might take two to three minutes to heat that litre of water. Well, that's basically what's going on here. There's a whole lot, you've remo removed a huge amount of energy from the water in the loop, which means to put the energy back into the water, it's going to take a huge amount of time. So you can further manipulate this by doubling the water. If you had even more water in the loop, say a bigger res, it would take even longer for this 100 watt CPU to return this loop to ambient or increase it above ambient. And we do remember, need to remember that 10 watts is being removed. Now it's important to realize that actually the same thing happens on the hot side. And this is where a lot of problems comes in when people do benchmarking and testing of radiators and water cooling loops, is that uh, you fire up your, your testing loop and you declare that the water cooling loop is fantastic after, say, 15 minutes of testing, but that is not necessarily long enough for the hot side to have actually increased in temperature just because of the volume of water. And so in testing water cooling systems, you actually need to wait quite a long time, like an hour, for it to normalize before you can claim how good your water cooling is. But of course, most people don't, and they compare that to an air cooling uh, heatsink, where it only takes a minute or two to normalize because copper and aluminium has a very low specific heat, or if you like, its ability to store energy is very, very low relative to water. So that's how you get cheating chillers. So if someone says, slash, is trying to, to suggest to you that they've achieved the impossible, they really need to run it for hours and see if it actually is true. Because of course, if you are adding 100 watts into your loop and only removing 10, then there is no doubt that this is going to be a big disaster. It's just a question of how long it will take. And you could you could even take this further if you wanted to, and, and use the specific heat of water. And you could say, well, you don't even need a radiator on the hot side. You can just get rid of this. You could just have a massive reservoir of water and pump all your heat into that, and it will slowly heat that up. Now, you do have the inverse of that, and that is that it, if it takes an hour to heat it up, it might take an hour to cool it down. So it's not a win-win situation. And that's also uh, where you have water cooling loops that have been running for high loads for a long period of time, and the water temperature has increased. You remove the load, and the, the, the heat is still stored in the water in the hot side of the loop, and so therefore you'll get quite, potentially, quite bad uh, idle temperatures because it needs to spend another hour, say, removing the heat out of the water. So yes, cheating chillers. It's, it's quite a common occurrence where people will claim that, that they've achieved the impossible and all they're really doing is pre-cooling a large volume of water, then running a test and claiming that it is going to achieve wonderful temperatures. And in a chiller you've got a double effect of that. Well, assuming you've got a water-to-water -water TEC chiller, you've got the double effect. You've got the stored energy in the cold side loop and you've got the stored energy in the hot side loop. So it could take an enormous amount of time for a water-to-water -water chiller to equalize or, yeah. And of course, like I said, the more water you have, the longer it will, it will take. So the more radiators you have on the hot side, the longer it will take to get to a normalized temperature. So that's cheating chillers. Watch out for them. Don't be duped into cheating chillers. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed that one, and we shall see you on the next one, guys. See you later. Bye-bye.